live from the Hee Haw Theater in Branson, Missouri. It's the Prime Minister of Humor, Reverend Grady Nutt. Boy, y'all can join my church any time. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you can join the Pentecostal church. That's where you can join. All of you like to smoke indoors can join the Catholics. They let you do anything over there, you know. Well, it's good to have all of you here. I'm absolutely delighted. This is Friday night in Branson, one of the dullest nights in the world. And um, Highway 76 is the world's only two-lane parking lot. And uh, there have been people born on this side of Highway 76 that have never seen what's on the other side. <laughs> Saw Oral Roberts out here the other day on roller skates going car to car, doing his best. You know, he's... Trying to raise money. He said, if y'all wouldn't come to Tulsa, he was coming to you. So you have, you have to watch it. Well, it's good to be in Branson. I've, I've, had, uh, I've had all kinds of crazy times in my life because I, I have a strange, unfettered, in the high branches by your little fingernail kind of humor. I always get tickled at ordinary, strange things. There's a difference between humor and comedy. I don't know if you're aware of this, but humor is the fun that we notice, but comedy is the fun we invent. A lot of people think they're funny because they can remember all the stuff in italics every month that they found at the end of long articles in Reader's Digest. People that remember jokes aren't necessarily funny. <laughs> but humor is quite a different deal. Sometimes the best joke you know you're sharing your 27th anniversary with. So... Or you're aging with. You see, <laughs> humor is really people. It's just the folks around us doing what comes naturally and sometimes weirdly. And I adore it. I just love that kind of stuff. I find it everywhere. I find it in all kinds of crazy places like church. Signs. I love signs. Found one in an optometry shop one time in Greenville, South Carolina. A little blue sign in the window said, <laughs> Eyes examined while you wait. And you're dang right, you know. I'm not leaving mine like shoe heels, you know. Now I walked away from that and got to thinking, I'd love to play a trick on those folks. They put their sign out and didn't think what they said. I'd love to just get them. What I plan to do is get two ping pong balls and draw eyes on them. And put red squiggles so it looked like you've been reading late. <laughs> Then I'm going to walk in there and open the door with my elbow, squinting real hard. Now, anybody that's ever sung in a church choir knows that you can squint and still peek. We've all done that. Now, you hold these two ping pong balls squinting, and you feel your way down the wall with your wristwatch. There's a lady sitting at a desk. All she does all day is take phone calls and make appointments and call people back and say, your glasses are in, Miss Simpson. Or, Mr. Hawkins, you have an appointment tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. That's all this dear lady does. Now she looks up and here you come at her, squinting and feeling the wall. You got her undivided attention. Now just walk up to your knees, bonk on the front of her desk. But don't, but don't. If there are wheels on her chair, she will be rolling back. <laughs> now, when you've got her in a moment of total concentration, <laughs> just lean over and put those ping pong balls on her desk and say, I'm in no rush, ma'am. I'll get them Thursday and walk out. <laughs> you can do that.
But see, my big frustration was that I felt called into the ministry at a very early age. In the Baptist church, you get called to the ministry. Methodists and Presbyterians volunteer. Baptists get drafted. And I felt called into the ministry. And the Bethel Missionary Baptist Church in Amarillo, Texas licensed me to the Baptist ministry two weeks after my 13th birthday. I could legally perform weddings in the 8th grade. Fortunately, nobody asked. I never did perform any weddings when I was in high school, but I was popular. <laughs> I had a little deal worked out for 50 cents. I'd give you a weekend heavy hugging permit. Then I'd give you a dime discount if you'd come by my locker Monday and confess. You know, I could. <laughs> At least I could counsel with you, you know. Well, I went around wanting everybody to know that I had been truly called into the ministry. And you could tell by the way I said ministry. See, if you say ministry, you're probably Presbyterian, thought it'd be a good change of pace, see, but... When you get called into the ministry, you say ministry. In fact, I've seen preachers talk about it, throw their wallets out. Just, you know, just ministry. Another way you could tell I was going into the ministry, I always wore a necktie with a plain white t-shirt. Another way you could tell I was going into the ministry was my tone of voice. Sixteen years old in high school, and I'd pass you in a hall, and you'd say, Hey, Grady, bless you, Marvin, bless you. <laughs> See, you give up your natural voice when you enter the ministry. <laughs> preacher's tone of voice is so crucial. I've seen a preacher with the right tone of voice that could read the ingredients off the back of a Nestle's Quick box and put the proper feeling and interpretation and meaning into words like riboflavin, <laughs> niacin, potassium. And people would stand weeping and volunteer for foreign missions. I'll go up and see. A preacher with the right tone of voice can actually get you to quit something you're not doing. <laughs> to me, that's the ultimate preaching. But probably the most important way you could tell that I had been called into the ministry <laughs> was the Bible I carried. And we carried them everywhere in our young years in the ministry. <laughs> Things are sort of a factory issue to young ministers. Fourteen pounds. Big heavy duty deal, made you kind of lean to one side, gave you a look of concern and burden and compassion, which ministers ought to have, usually mistaken for gas. <laughs> now that big Bible served a lot of purposes. Kept coffee tables from blowing away during tornadoes. But probably the most valuable asset that that Bible had for a young minister had to do with where the young minister did most of his early preaching, usually Route 7, the Magnolia Baptist Church, off out around a big curve near the creek. Now you go out that little church to preach and you're 14, 15, 16 years old and they let you come and fill in when the real preacher's gone. And I'd go out there at 16 years old and just, ha, ah, let them have it, you know, and they're trying hard not to laugh because I didn't have the foggiest notion of what I was talking about. But I'd get up there and just really romp and stomp and act like I knew it. Then you eat lunch with one of these farm families, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But during the afternoon, you go out about 2.30 and visit the sick and the afflicted. And if they're not any afflicted, you spend an extra half hour and you afflict somebody. Every community needs some afflicted. 